after a lot of uh, indecision, uh, um, I decided on a method of examination, which is going to be uh, to ask you to give you some questions of which you will be able to uh, opt for four out of more, and to ask you to describe in your words in no more than 10 lines what you understood of it or what you think of it. Uh, you can use your notes. Now, if you're going to prepare super notes uh, so that uh, everything is covered, better still, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've achieved what I wanted. And um, if you prefer, because this is not a test of English, if you prefer to do it in French or in Spanish or in Italian, you can do it, okay? Not other languages. Because <laughs> My resources are limited. <laughs> So those are the languages I can more or less speak, uh, but that's all. Uh, yeah. Good. Um, okay, and let me tell you, now I see the end of the tunnel. So what we're going to do is the following, and I hope that we will make it. Um, we will... Uh, see uh, the equilibrium theorems that are important, or a linear response in equilibrium uh, today. And then, um, and then we will uh, do a little bit of large deviations, and my uh, desire is to show you the fluctuation theorem, which is one of the most uh, uh, popular results in the last 30 years in, in out of equilibrium, and, and which will also give you an, a clear idea of the second principle and entropy production. So it, it's very, a very nice exercise. And then the last uh, day or, or so, we are going to see uh, a bit of active matter, which is the violation of all the things that equilibrium gives you. And um, I'm going to be very brief, but you will see more or less how it goes, okay? So that, that should be it. Okay, so now uh, linear response slash equilibrium theorems. So imagine you are in a situation where your system is in equilibrium Somebody wants yeah. to ask? Ah, yeah. Um, please, before you start, I have simple questions. Um, does every equilibrium system satisfy the detailed balance? So yes, but let me let me let me insist on this point. Uh, I, as I told you a few times, I am using equilibrium in se and everybody uses equilibrium in, in several different senses. So let's let's be clear. First of all, sense number one, your bath is a good equilibrium bath. This is given to you by uh, all the things we did to construct a good, decent bath with response, with uh, noise correlated in a way it has to do, and so on, let's say of temperature T. Then here is your system, which is in contact with a bath. And we want the system, I remember I used as a notation and I was consistent in doing it in blue, I don't know if you remarked that, where forces that derive from a potential do not derive from a potential at zero. And no time dependence. This you need because if not, your system is breaking equilibrium. That's Condition number one, condition number two. And condition number three is that um, you prepare your system. Now, when you prepare your system, sometimes it is not in equilibrium. Suppose, for example, I pour a glass of water which is at 30 degrees and mix and whatever, and then I put it in a bath at 20 degrees, which is a perfectly nice bath, and let it stay. Well, the system, for example, its energy, for example, will go to a value, and by the time I'm here, I can say that my system is in equilibrium. So there are three things. The bath has to be good. You don't have to spoil it with your system. 
And then you have to give it time to happen. Now, give it time to happen uh, depends on the system. Uh, there are systems that equilibrate very quickly, water, and there are systems like glasses that we know that can take, I don't know, a few billion years. So it depends on the system, okay? Because it has to explore its phase space and it's very bad at doing it, okay? So when we say equilibrium, we mean <laughs> a bit of everything. Uh, so when people say the word equilibrium, it could be a, a mix of all these uh, senses, okay? But bear in mind this. So for example, yesterday somebody asked me afterwards, I don't know, I think it was you, about entropy production, which of which we will talk more. So if, let's say, I have no forcing and no time dependent nothing, my, and I prepare my system, there's going to be entropy production because my system is wanting to explore all phase space. Once it's in equilibrium, it's very happy and if there is no forcing, entropy production stops. So it would be something like this, measured in some way. On the contrary, if there is forcing or there is, for example, an alternating field, your entropy production goes on forever and forever. And uh, you are putting work into the system. Okay? Uh, so and uh, what about detail balance? So detail balance is the fact that your bath is a good bath. Detail balance is a property of the bath, not of you. As we shall see, I hope, at the end of the day, there is something very nice that happens, that you have a bath that has detail balance connected to a system, and then the system, if it's an okay system, will equilibrate. And then I could ask, okay, can I use this as a bath for, for a new system? And the answer is, does this, the dynamics of this in contact with my system now obey detail balance? And you will see that in half an hour, the answer is, this is what the fluctuation dissipation theorem tells you, which is one of the objects of today. Uh, but also to get uh, detail balance, you should have no forcing, right? No I mean forcing also here, and of course the bath has to be decent. Also two should be true, right? Yes, in order yes, to have, uh, uh, sorry. Yes, 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 of course. Your system plus the bath have yeah. to have detail balance. Yes, sorry, sorry. Yes. Okay, then if you're going to do Langevin or you're going to do Monte Carlo or you're going to do what is called heat bath, these are, they, they all have detail balance or not, uh, but usually they do, and that's it. Okay, uh, um, so, so what we're going to do is the following. What does one want to know? What does uh, Mahesh want to know when he does an experiment? Uh, one of the things that you want to know is uh, you prepare your system and now we will assume it is in equilibrium. So we are in equilibrium. The bath was good, the time was enough, I didn't force it, it was in equilibrium. Remember that equilibrium is tightly related to time reversal. So if, if if I wouldn't be lazy and I wanted to write a book on StatMec, I would divide it in two sections. Uh, I, would, I would first talk about macroscopic CT or not and what do, can we do with the fact that we have many degrees of freedom as I did with you. And then the, the book would be divided in two sections. Statistical mechanics with time reversal, statistical mechanics without time reversal. When there is a form of time reversal, you're train takes you to equilibrium properties, partition functions, everything where the time has to be taken out. If there is no time reversal, as I told you many times, you do what you can. Uh, in the books, the second part, if it occupies five pages, it, I, I'm exaggerating. I mean, there's nothing about it. But now with uh, active matter and things like that, we are much more into that. Okay, so now I have my system in equilibrium and I have, this is my system, let's say it's in contact with a bath, 
that took it to equilibrium at temperature T, and then I have an observable, I don't know the position or the density or the magnetization or whatever, and I have another observable. For example, this could be the magnetization and this the density, any, anything. And uh, as you know, the, uh, we have the Langevin, the Bach, etc., etc. so we have an ensemble of trajectories. So let's say we start from a point and then according to the noise, different trajectories and the probability that these do is represented by the uh, Fokker-Planck or the Smoluchowski and or the Kramers equation, okay? So at time t prime, I decide to measure A. Fortunately, it's a classical system so I can measure it without destroying it, it's okay. And then, I continue at a time t prime, I decide to measure b. At time t, sorry, I decide to measure b. Okay? Now, of course, this is one experiment, experiment number one. This is experiment number two, which I did exactly the same protocol and I started again. But of course, the noise realization is slightly different. And uh, I do it again and I get another one. So. I want to measure the correlation, so it's going to be C A B of T T prime. I always put second the smallest time. I think everybody does, but I'm not sure. Um, which is the average over all the realizations of the experiments of, of the noise of A of uh, B of T, let's say, A of T prime. So I measure this, I measure this, I record the value. Redo the experiment, measure this, measure this, record the value, measure again, redo the experiment, and then I take the average. This is what is called the correlation function. It tells you how much B at time T depends on what A was at time T prime. Please, I have a question about the, the type of interaction. So, once you, uh, one, uh, when you have your system and you have the buff, so for all the type of interaction, are we going, are we going to have equilibrium, always have equilibrium? Or yes. there are type of interaction that doesn't allow my system to, to reach Your system keeps on being in equilibrium, for yes. all type of interaction. Yes, uh, uh, for, the, for the interactions that are okay, no? That you're not, for the moment we are doing things that are uh, we are I'm not violating equilibrium. So I start in equilibrium, measure something without disturbing it, measure again, but the system is like a glass of water at 20 degrees that stays all day, a glass of water at 20 degrees. Okay. I'm not stirring it or doing in anything strange to it. Okay, this is a correlation. And then there is another measure that is also interesting, perhaps even more interesting, is I start my system at a time, then go on, and when I arrive here, I am going to perturb it, give it a little kick. So V, or let's, let's make it integrating, starting from minus infinity up to time uh, T, I apply a tiny little field, which means that instead of V, I will have V plus delta H times A. So I am perturbing a little bit my system up to time T prime. And then at time T, I measure B. Yes. The same as it was above, yes. Yes, the same. So this is an important measure. It tells you how much the system responds to a little kick, okay? This quantity here, I'm going to denote
And so it is defined as, um, I, will, I will tell you in a second. Just to be sure, so delta H is uh, non-zero up to time uh, P prime, and then it's second Then I zero. cut it off. And the calculation we're going to do is in the limit of the perturbation very small. So we, it is an expansion in powers of delta H, and we keep the first. This gives the name to the topic, and this is how the books call it, linear response. The linear means linear in delta H. Okay, and uh, because it's linear, if I do dif different things, I can add the effect of different stories of the field. Another way of putting the same is to say, instead of doing this kind of experiment, if I write here, will you be able to see it? Yes. Okay, so another way that is often introduced would be I do nothing up to time t prime, and there I give it a kick with a, so this depends on time, it does blip. I turn on the field and turn it off very quickly, and at time th here I measure. This one is called RAB, which is how does B change at time T when I gave A a kick at time T prime. And you see, because of linear response, if I consider this thing, I can think of it as blip, 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 a lot of little kicks continuously in time. So, this is just the integral between minus infinity and time t prime of r of t t prime, d, uh, sorry, t t second, d t second, r a b. Any other story you can reconstruct from knowing this one, because it's linear response, meaning that the effect of doing kicks at different times to, to linear order, they're additive. Okay, these two things are super important. Super important because this is what uh, an experimentalist can do. Uh, an experimentalist can hardly go and look at what every part, well, mostly, what every particle in the system does. But these are the things that you can measure. Okay, and now we are going to show two results that are for an equilibrium system, only for an equilibrium system, meaning that it's a system that stays, is and stays in equilibrium since time minus infinity forever and ever. And um, yes, um, so, and as you will see, the, the, these results are intimately related to detail balance. So, first result is called Onsager reciprocity. I believe that Onsager got the Nobel Prize for this, basically. Although you probably, or some of you probably know him more for having solved uh, the Ising model, which is a tour de force, or was a tour de force at his time. Uh, he was a great chemist. And this is the result. I think that this is why he was given the Nobel Prize. Uh, so the, the, the thing is, 
sorry, before that, let zero is This one is very easy, so I always forget it. If you think a bit of what you're doing here, remember that the system is in equilibrium since minus infinity. Now you measure at time t prime, then you measure at t. You see that the starting point doesn't really matter. So if I do at t prime plus an hour, and I measure at t plus an hour, because I am in equilibrium, you see this glass of water, if I do an experiment now, and one minute later, so I measure and I do the experiment tomorrow, and one minute later, you expect exactly the same thing because it is in equilibrium. So time translational invariance means that CAB is going to be and the same is true of the responses. If I have a system in equilibrium, give it a little kick at time t prime and measure it one minute later, it's the same as, a, if, as if I do the same thing tomorrow. What matters is the minute, not the starting time, okay? So time translationally invariance is not the same as saying equilibrium, but equilibrium implies time translational invariance. Why is it not? Because if I have a system that I'm constantly bothering and it has reached a stationary state, you get time translation, but you're not in equilibrium. Okay. Property number two, which we're going to prove, I'm going to do it a bit quickly. But the most important thing is that you understand the logic. This is an amazing result. If I measure A and then I measure B and calculate the correlation, it's the same as first measuring B and then measuring A. Uh, it's not obvious at all. And for example, with active matter, it doesn't happen. Even stationary active matter. For a system that is conducting heat, even if it's stationary, it doesn't happen. For economy, the, the, the market fluctuations of the prices, it doesn't happen. You could do correlations of the market. Now the price of the kilo of wheat today and tomorrow, it's a fluctuating quantity. Eh? It does, uh, well, and now you correlate two quantities, price of maize and price of wheat, and then you do the other way around. There is no property like this. So of all the dynamics of the universe, equilibrium is very specific. Remember that we have said many, many times that it's time reversal. So okay, I'll do, I'm going to do it very quickly. You will okay. get the logic. So CAB. Jorge, isn't this because it works only in equilibrium because the quantities A and B have to be canonically conjugate? No, is it not? It doesn't matter at all. Any A and B will do. What is important is that systems in equilibrium have detailed balance, as you will see, and they are in equilibrium. You will see it now. So C A B of T minus T prime, I can write it as. So this process, I'm, instead of doing it with Langevin, I'm going to do it with Fokker-Planck, yes? The first here. Translation. Ah, here, Onsager, that's the name of the gentleman. He was Norwegian. So, I'm going to write it and then I'm going to explain it. This is the Fokker Planck thing. So this is the Gibbs measure. We are in equilibrium, so we can use it. This is my notation in bracket notation. I measure B, I evolve in T minus T prime. I measure A, and this is, remember, the constant. So yesterday somebody asked me, this is what? 
This is the queues to which you can go, integrate over everywhere you can go. This is just telling you that after I measure, you can do whatever you like, I don't care. I'm going to sum up. Because once I do the second measure, I, I ignore the system. So this is how you write a correlation in the bracket notation. You will find it also just by doing integrals. If you prefer that one, uh, you, can, you can do it with that one. And now, the trick we have to use for all these things is to see that there is time reversal. So now, to use time reversal, I want to reverse here B and A. And how do I do it when I have a sandwich of operators? I take the transpose of what is inside. And the transpose of this is itself, it's a function of the coordinates. Of this, this is a function of the coordinates. This is a function of the coordinates. And the transpose of this, remember, is the transpose of this. But the transpose of this, we did it and we can apply detailed balance. So let me first write, so Gibbs appears now in the left, then I have B, remember when I transpose the order changes, then I have E T minus T prime, and then I have H dagger, Fokker Planck, then I have A, and then I have the flat thing, okay? Up to now, I have done nothing, almost. And now we're going to use the time reversal property, detail balance. So remember that this one we did it yesterday, is equal to e to the beta b, e to the minus t minus t prime h, e to the minus beta v, and then I have a and I have b. This, I have just now used the detail balance property, which is you see, and, and here I reverse times, and now I put them straight by using detail balance. And now it's very easy, because this one multiplied by a constant gives me the Gibbs measure. And the Gibbs measure, e to the minus b times an exponential, gives me the flat thing. B is a function of the coordinates, so I can commute it with these. These are functions of coordinates. So at the end of the day, this gives me, tuck, tuck. I'm sorry, did I, no, I'm okay. I'm using this one. This is the magic of having used detail balance. And so this here you recognize exactly CBA. If you, okay, ask me questions on this, but the important thing that you have to bear in mind <laughs> is that I use the time reversal that I have in my problem, which is detail balance. So, sorry, um, just this one. For, so, B and E to the minus beta B commute. Commute because there are some simple yeah, functions numbers, of the coordinates, yes. yes. And uh, Gibbs times E to the beta B is just uh, flat. 
just well, flooded. You see how important it is that at the beginning I start with Gibbs. If I don't start with Gibbs, uh, I don't get that, which means that the, this thing works to the extent that you start in equilibrium. It is important that I start in equilibrium. It is important that I have detailed balance. So maybe would it help to write explicitly that Gibbs is the same integral times e to the minus beta? Okay, so uh, yes, okay. So this is the flat guy. So if I multiply the flat guy, well, let's do it to the right by e to the minus beta v exponential times flat, except for a normalization, I get Gibbs. Oh, so uh, e to the minus beta v should be inside the integral, right? Because it depends on the coordinates. Yes, yes, because yeah. you apply it yeah. to this one, so you yeah. can put yeah. it if you. Uh, e to the minus plus beta Gibbs this has a, a negative exponent, and this is proportional to the flat one. This is the property that we have used for the last step. But the important thing is that I just put the things, and look what I've done, and everything falls in place. Uh, so, sorry, I, I, I didn't understand why the time integral in that equation is negative infinity. Sorry, here? The, yeah. Yes. In X V. Why did you uh, write uh, time to be negative infinity to T prime? I decided. You decided? I decided. Uh, to define this function, uh, so I can tell the experimentalist, this function tells you uh, what happens if you have a field on until time t prime and you cut it there? Uh, if, and then this one is the same thing, it's a derivative, because if I put the field up to here and I cut it here, the difference is this. And because I have linear response, it's, the difference corresponds to a little kick less. This is why this is the integral of that. So if Mahesh wants to do an experiment where for five minutes he turns the field on, and then for two minutes he puts it with a different sign, and for five more minutes he puts it twice as strong, he just has to integrate a lot of these blips, and within linear response, it's additive, the effect. That's why it's, it's called linear response theory. Thank you. Okay, this is quite amazing, no? I mean, uh, think of it. You, are, you have a complicated system of which you don't know anything. You have thermodynamical quantities. And now, by knowing the microscopy that it's at the bottom of it, you have discovered that if I measure magnetization now and density later, or vice versa, I'm going to get, at the same time, I'm going to get the same number. It's, it's quite... Remarkable, no? Okay. Now we're going to do the second property, which is a bit more difficult, but the idea is more or less similar. So, we want to calculate this guy, no? So uh, first thing we have to bear in mind is that chi AB of T, T prime is going to be chi AB of T minus T prime because if you translate both times the experiment because you're in equilibrium is exactly the same. And now remember what chi is. It's the result of having a little field from time zero to time t prime. So 
and then we measure A. So with the same logic as before, I start with Gibbs, but with Gibbs with H plus, sorry, V plus delta H times A. This is this part. Then I evolve it. Then I measure B, and then I don't care. It can go anywhere. And this is chi. OK? OK, so now we're going to make an auxiliary calculation. Auxiliary, but very simple. We want to calculate how is Gibbs of V plus delta H A. So it's Gibbs. Uh, hmm. Yes, in here I reverse the orders of A and B, but okay, I think that I can live with that. So it's what? It's Gibbs is what? It's E to the minus beta V plus delta H A. And I have to divide it, careful with this one, by the partition function, the integral, which I'm going to explicitly write it. This is what it is. So this is this guy here. And now my job is to expand for small this. OK, so two places. In one place, when I expand, Okay, so this is going to be e to the minus beta v divided by dq e to the minus beta v, okay, dq prime, dq prime, and this is v of q, plus things. Okay, this is a bit painful, but we, we shall do it. We first differentiate with respect to de delta H plus delta H times. On one hand, when I take this one down, it's minus A times this thing. Okay, this is the first term times beta A, sorry, times this thing, okay? It's just that I took this guy down, and this is first term, second term. And then I have to differentiate this one. So I take this one down, and uh, when you do it carefully, and then, okay, we will read it together, I get also the same e to the minus beta v of q over the integral, this same thing. And here, I get the following thing. And here, it's the same integral, so it's twice. And here, it's finished. It's just 
I'm, I'm studying the small modification this does in, in, in orders of delta H. So here I took the derivative of what's below, so I get a square with a negative sign, so this is what, and then I get the derivative of what's inside, I split it in two so that this and this are the same, and this is what I have. And there is a beta that I have, as usual, forgotten. It's just a derivative. Sorry, here I forgot something important. It's the variation when I change H. Okay, and when you look at it carefully, sorry, this is a bit messy. This is the same Gibbs measure, and this is simply all this thing here is minus beta A and this here you see that this is the expectation of A so here I put minus A and what I'm multiplying by is precisely the Gibbs without delta H. So all in all, what we get is that Gibbs Without it, so this is the correction we were looking for. It's long but trivial, yeah, but uh, just a derivative. So just to recap, I have been applying this field up to time t prime, and what I find at time t prime is this, and now I just, because this is a small correction, linear response, I am developing it, and I discover that it is the ordinary Gibbs, but it has this correction term. And so now I want to plug this into here, the first term, it's going to be the ordinary thing, but we are looking at the variation with respect to delta H. So the result we are seeking for is I need to plug this thing with a sign into here, and then I will be okay. Okay? Because it's the, it's the thing with the delta H, without the delta H, without, it's simply this piece, and with is this additional term. So this additional term modifies the thing and it will come here. So now I use that formula and I replace this thing here. The first term is going to give me the thing without the delta H. The second term is proportional to delta H and it is the one I'm looking for. And what is it? I have to take a beta, so
and we're done. Just half a step more, and we're done. A sign, I think, yes. I'm really sorry, but I'm totally lost since you defined the gifts and up to the end. Okay. I didn't really okay. understand. So, when I start my experiment here, I am starting the experiment, but I have equilibrium, but under a small field. The equilibrium under a small field is uh, this guy here. So, it is the Gibbs formula uh, with a delta H A. It's almost like the old one because the field is not very strong, but it has a slight modification. And this is going to be important because at time zero, T prime, sorry, I am sort of, I have been disturbing the system up to that time. So uh, the, the measure of Gibbs uh, was something like this, but now it had a, a field. But the, the, the rule of the game is that we're doing everything with very weak, small fields. So the correction of the Gibbs uh, measure is going to be small. So small, uh, how small? Well, I just write it down, which is what I did, and I expand all the exponentials I have. I use e to the minus beta v plus delta h a. I will expand them or, de or take the derivative as e minus beta v and then I have e to the delta h. So it's one plus minus beta delta h a. And then higher orders, I don't care. What I have done here is just systematically use this one. If you use this one everywhere and you keep things uh, properly, and you have to do it on the top and in the bottom. So the top is very easy because it's just a term like this. But the bottom is a bit more complicated because you're taking the derivative of this. So it's the square of this times the derivative of what's inside. And then you get this term and, 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 and that's it. So when you do all the turn the crank, you get the old Gibbs plus this extra uh, variation that you have to take into account to first order in delta H. Now, I want to replace this for the Gibbs without. So I use the Gibbs without, but I need to do the correction. So uh, the correction is, well, the first term is what it is without the delta H. The second term is this. This is the correction. So I take this thing here and put it here, here. So the Gibbs is this Gibbs here. And then I have this extra term, which is the one, this and this, which, if you rewrite it, is exactly this, this term here. So if you want, this here is the correction to Gibbs. OK? Is it OK? I can put. So the difference between the two is going to be, by definition, this object here. Now, this object here I can distribute, so I get BA, term number one, and term number two is B times the expectation of A, but the expectation of A is a number that I can take it out. So at the end of the day, what I get is this, B and B. And this is equal to, and this is the remarkable result,
So what have we done? We wanted to understand how a system responds to a field and after doing some calculation where we have used equilibrium, we get to a point where we discover that the, uh, that the um, response to the system of, to this field is given by the correlation, by a correlation. This is very bizarre. Let us write it in the most usual way. You see that chi is the integral of r. So if I take the derivative here, I can write it as r a b of t t prime is equal. I'm going to differentiate because I like it with respect to the second one. So this will absorb the, the minus sign. And this is the fluctuation dissipation theorem as you read. Fluctuation dissipation theorem. And sorry, here I could use minus because it's, we are in equilibrium. This is technical, but this is the simplest proof there is in the market. Uh, you won't, I think, find a simpler proof than, than this one. Except for the bracket notation, which if you like it is easy, and if you don't, it's not. Okay, so now um, let me keep this one. On Sagar we have seen, and let me, let us discuss a bit what this means. Um, I'm going to erase, is it okay? Just for remembering, you don't need to copy what I'm going to write. Remember when we wrote, when we, when we got rid at the very beginning or oh, some days ago, of the thermal bath, and we arrived at this equation. You don't need to copy this one. This was the noise. And we said that if I do, if I remember correctly, this was okay. And we said that this. Uh, we said that this, the equality of this guy multiplied by the temperature with this guy was called the fluctuation dissipation theorem or relation of the first kind. So that the one we have just derived is of the second kind. But they are exactly the same thing. And this is what I want to transmit to you because it's very, very important. So. What is the correlation of noise noise? Well, it refers to the bath which was made of a lot of oscillators, whatever. But it is a correlation, just like the one we found. And uh, what is the friction? This is the hard part. What is the friction? The friction is the response because when I try to move in water, the water opposes me. And this is the response that the water is doing to my motion. So the point of this is that the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which is completely general for an equilibrium system, is what we found before when we integrated all the oscillators was nothing but the fluctuation dissipation theorem as applied to this bath of oscillators. So, and this calculation 
you can find it in my notes, you take a system that is in equilibrium now. It is in contact with a bath. And the system has A and B or whatever. Let's say only A, A equals B, only one. And to this A, we connect a thermometer. What is a simple thermometer? For example, an oscillator. It's a thermometer because an oscillator will catch some energy and the energy it catches is a measure of what the temperature was in, of the system. When you compute how much energy does it get when you're coupling this to, as a thermometer, you will discover that you get exactly this equation for the, for the oscillator with uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem of the system telling you exactly that these two things are the same. It's the relation between the uh, correlation, which is the noise correlation. The noise, because why the noise? Because for me, if I'm looking at the system, my noise is coming from the system. And for me, if I look at the system, my friction is coming from the response that the system gives me. You will see this calculation in detail. But the important thing to bear in mind is that fluctuation dissipation is telling you that if I am in equilibrium, I can connect, for example, an oscillator, but any thermometer will do. Okay, this is an old fashioned glass uh, thermometer. And to any observable I like, and it will exchange energy exactly with the mechanism that Einstein discovered for the Brownian motion, exactly so the fluctuations of this system, which are measured by the correlation, are going to give me energy, and the friction the system applies to me, which is given by the response, if you want the detail of how you show that, you will find it in, in my notes, but it, it, is, it is clear that they are the same thing, and they satisfy this relation, which is nothing but this relation, because you see here, This is the temperature goes there, yeah? So, um, so, so, Jorge, so, sorry, yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, so, uh, if I want to <coughs> interpret this, so, uh, looks like this eta is playing the same role of, uh, correlation of the H, uh, uh, the in the sense that, uh, I can think uh, of, uh, that equation as being uh, an equation where essentially you perturb the potential by minus eta times q, right? Yes, but the eta uh, <coughs> works like an h uh, for me uh, that I am a q, no? I am, I am q, so it's working for, for, for me. But if I couple this thermometer to this bath, what I will see is that the eta is the noise that the system is doing to me the noise of A, the magnetization. But the correlations of the noise of the magnetization, the so it's a correlation of the magnetization minus the, the expectation value, is precisely the amplitude of the noise that the system is giving me. But there is a second term that comes from the fact that when my system moves, it acts on the bath, let's say, or when my thermometer changes it. And there is a retro, um, feedback, and this is the re given by the response function. And when you do it with a bath, with oscillators, you do it, and we did it, and it was okay. But if you want to couple to any system, you can use the fact that it satisfies fluctuation dissipation to show that any system in equilibrium will be a good bath for you. This is very, very important, because now you see that uh, what Einstein was doing is that uh, instead of an oscillator, he had a particle of pollen, of Brownian particles. And instead of whatever, he had the water where this was dancing. And the correlation and the response of the water, meaning the noise you get from the water, plus the friction, they are precisely given by these two terms. 
So fluctuation dissipation that sometimes is given to you as, wow, look at this nice property that allows you to measure correlations just by measuring. It's much more than that. It's at the heart of what equilibrium and measuring a temperature means. And what have we used to prove it? This is the important part, the calculation. You can check it to tonight, for example. Uh, the, what we have used is that the system starts with a Gibbs measure, or if it was under a field, it starts with the appropriate Gibbs measure, and that it evolves in equilibrium fashion. So please, uh, you, you didn't make a comment about the fact that uh, it may happen if in the case where we have a, a storm field, like for the perturbation, because in our case, you just consider the fact that the field is a, a rig. Is rig. So you what's happen if we are in the case of a storm field? If, if you apply a, a strong field, so you could, you, you, you see that I did everything to order delta H. And I said that if you, computer pulse like this of field and another one like this and you this one where you do the two are just the sum this is linear response to order linear if you go to delta h squared which a, a little bit stronger field you're lost there's nothing easy you can say it all becomes nonlinear horrible so beyond linear response, when the fields are a bit larger, life becomes more, you cannot do a calculation like this. So, yeah. So it's called nonlinear response. Of course, in life, these things happen, but there are no, it gets really quickly very, very hard. I mean, you, you can, of course, in the computer compute it, but there are no, the relations are much more complicated and not very useful. You mentioned that this is useful also because uh, it's like uh, more simple for experimentalists to, to measure it and uh, is it even like simpler than measuring over the linear, uh, like uh, it's simple to do the linear response? Is it simpler than doing like a higher order response for experimentalists? I think that experimentalists usually prefer responses, no? Because yeah, applying a field and seeing how the magnetization grows or applying a pressure and seeing how the volume changes is much better than looking at how the positions of the molecules correlate over time. No? Absolutely. Because we don't have access to the micros microstructure of the system. So we are always trying to infer what are the macroscopic responses arising due to some microscopic change. That is what all condensed matter and physics are. Yeah. And then these things happen also in quantum mechanics and so on. Uh, but it's interesting that um, my feeling is that uh, sometimes the books don't emphasize how important fluctuation dissipation is. And uh, we have to go back to the in intuition of Einstein with respect to Brownian motion. He said, put it in a modern way, you would say, I put a particle of pollen inside the water. The particle of pollen measures the correlation of the crashing uh, velocities of the, of the water, for sure. But it also measures the response because when it tries to move because of all the crashes it got, it finds that the, they respond. And you can show that the response is precisely the response we defined here. So these two things must be equilibrated because I need that my pollen particle is in equipartition or some form of equilibrium. It cannot heat up because then I would be able to throw in pollen and get energy from water. It has to be at the same temperature. And this intuition, uh, which is for us maybe easy, but it was quite, quite clever, um, 
is the idea behind fluctuation dissipation too, only that this way we can formalize it. Or the way my advisor taught me the first time he talked about fluctuation dissipation and frequency dependent susceptibility and all those concepts. He said, Mahesh, when you go to buy an old car, what do you do? You go and kick the tire and you listen for <laughs> loose parts that are about to fall off. That, that was the way he explained it. Um, I have a conceptual question, it's not, the, not on the technique. Uh, there is something more constrained, there seems something more constrained about Onsager reciprocity compared to FDT, and I could be wrong, which is that they're always the coupled transport coefficients. So you have the Seebeck and the Peltier, but they're, they're not, it's not as if they're response, one is response to the other. But you can, you can do the fluctuation dissipation cross, then it will be as, as, as. There is a nice way, but I didn't do it. I wanted to do it, but it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but a little bit, to derive the same thing we did for the response of fluctuation dissipation with explicitly time reversal. So which was why I asked if A and B have any constraints on what those two ob observables can be. Uh, um, or could no. they, they can't be any Anything you like. The only thing I didn't say, and it's important that I say it now, is that uh, I did it uh, about on Sager. Let me write on Sager. On Sager is CAB of T minus. We are in equilibrium. Huh? In fact, when you have velocities, you have to reverse them. So if this is Q. Uh, something of QP, and this is something of QP. Here it's going to be of Q minus P, Q minus P. If we, and so here I put a little bar to tell you if you're doing observables that are coordinates like the magnetization, huh, it's okay what I said. But if you're going to use velocities, you need to reverse their sign. If you do the same exercise that we did the f before, for reciprocity, you will see that naturally this appears because when you do time reversal, remember that in Kramers there is a flip of sign. I thought it wasn't worthwhile to make it the whole solution more complicated. Um, okay, so just to tell you, uh, there are lots of interesting things, for example, when you think of the financial markets, for example. There you have a system with observables, as I said, the price of wheat, and the price of, I don't know, uh, PCs. And then uh, suppose I uh, buy wheat, a lot of wheat, so the price goes up. Uh, and, uh, and I want to see, well, let's say it's a small perturbation. And then this may, for example, affect, for some mysterious reason, the price of PCs or something else, or the price of wheat, of course. And can I, or I look at simply the fluctuations of the price of wheat and the price of uh, corn, and then uh, I, I measure like this and I measure like that. And I ask myself, do I get something like that? Do I get something like that, a response in response to buying? In, and the answer is no, uh, which is amazing because the markets are made of millions of operators and they are fluctuations and everything, but they are not equilibrium. They don't have the specific uh, thing that equilibrium has, which all comes from some form of time reversal, detail balance or something like that. And we will see that you don't need to go to the markets um, the day after tomorrow we will see for active matter, which, for example, bacteria or motorized particles, the same happens. You don't have all these magical properties. So once again, just to convince you, the moment you put one foot outside equilibrium, you lost the measure, the Gibbs measure, and you lost a formula that gives you the measure. There is no simple formula that will give you the, stati the, the stationary distribution, and you lose the equilibrium theorems, and you lose reciprocity. So the r restrictions, now to repeat an old joke that I think was made for linear and nonlinear systems, to talk of 
non-equilibrium, the joke is from Ulam, but maybe, to talk of non-equilibrium systems is like talking of non-elephant zoology. Uh, it's all, most everything, you know? This, this, this um, it's, I think that the original phrase is Markat. Okay, to talk about non-linear systems is to talk about non-elephant system, uh, animals. Of course, most animals are not elephants. And, um, and here the same, I mean, uh, thanks God we can, so all the things that are related to equilibrium occupy 99% of your books. And there is very little left for out of equilibrium, but this is a completely unfair and unbalanced situation with respect to how the universe <laughs> works. With respect to what you know how to solve, then it's perfectly fair because out of equilibrium, as you will see, you will see perhaps the most flashy result in three decades, uh, the fluctuation theorem tomorrow, and you will see that it's nice, but it's not great. It's very modest thing. And it's also everything we know out of equilibrium is very modest. This, this one has to take into account. So I think I will stop here. Yes, Thank just you. one uh, observation that uh, say the, I mean this relation, I, if you consider this relation for the integrated response, the integrated response is minus beta times the connected correlation. When t is equal to t prime, then uh, it, it's just uh, yes. very easy. Yes, that one you can get without it's time. Yes, yes, very easy. So the non-trivial thing is that it extends two different to times. times. Yes. Yes. yes, 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 yes. Okay, so then uh, the exercise is uh, go through the lecture notes <laughs> now, uh, get this, um, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, depth here. So, uh, so we are going to meet again at uh, two to discuss uh, about these things and other things. Yes, I'll and once best. again, I'm ah. sorry I cannot participate. I have yeah. to give a seminar that has been long program. And uh, now uh, we, we are going to take uh, a photo if uh, I'm going to look for the photographer. And uh